Pokemon Sword and Shield are too easy, but why is that? Was it the forced experience share? The abundance of the newly added experience candies, or the levels just too low? I decided to remove these elements entirely by feeding my Switch some experience candies, in turn making every Pokemon level 100. And then I decided to do a hardcore Nuzlocke on top of that. I'm sure this isn't the first hardcore Nuzlocke video you've watched, but here's a quick refresher on the rules anyway. You can only catch the first encounter per route. If a Pokemon faints, it's no longer usable. Set mode must be on. No items can be used in battle, but held items are fine. There are level caps based on the next gym leader's ace, and you can only catch one Pokemon of an evolutionary line. In addition to this, I've added a few more rules. I will only be using a Pokemon's level 100 moveset. For clarification, when I say the level 100 moveset, I mean moves that a Pokemon would have if you catch them at level 100 in the wild. These are usually the last four moves that you see in their learn pool list when you look at a mover learner or online. You'll hear me use this term fairly often. I mean, that's the highest level it can be, so clearly that should be their best moveset, right? I will also not be allowed to use the mover learner other than to reteach Pokemon their level 100 moves. I'll also be banning TRs, but I'll allow TMs as they're weaker in this game, and otherwise some Pokemon will just be unusable. I won't visit any of the DLC areas as they'll give me far too many encounters. I'll only be allowed to use the same number of Pokemon as the gym leader, and I won't be allowed to start to max my Pokemon. And that's that, so let's get started. First things first, we need to pick our starter. This isn't a strict rule, but when presented with an option, I try and pick the one that would make the game more challenging. I'll go for Skull Bunny as it's the only starter out of the three that gets no stab moves at level 100. So we add Corny Buns to the team. It's time for our first battle with Hop, and... oh. Corny Buns seems to have missed the spirit of this challenge. I did the best I could. Well, my Nuzlocke don't start until I get Pokeballs, so moving on, I head into the Slumbering Weald and quickly train Corny Buns to level 100, carefully selecting which moves it should get at that level. A bit further into the woods, I run into a wolf. Buns is tastier than I am, so I make a strategic decision and walk out the forest a bit lighter, but feeling a bit heavier. The Nuzlocke doesn't start until I get Pokeballs, so Buns' death doesn't count. A moment later, Mum gives me some Pokeballs so I can't use that excuse anymore, and the Nuzlocke has officially started. My first two encounters are Rookity, who I call Oreo Kid, and Nickit, who I call IT Nick. Now ideally, I'd have liked to make all Pokemon level 100, including the wild Pokemon, but for some reason I decided to do this challenge in the first and only game that has level caps for catching Pokemon. After a two second Google search, I couldn't find a good way to remove these caps, so I went the old fashioned way, I juiced up Oreo Kid with rare candies and gave it the appropriate moveset. I prevent it from evolving as I want my encounters to remain the same as they would have if I caught them at level 100. I'll do that with all my encounters moving forward, but I'll save you some sanity points and not include that in the video. Nothing of note happened for the first two fights except Buns missing two bounces in a row. Hop challenges us to a fight once again, but it's only the first battle, so what could go wrong? Hop leads with Wooloo, and I lead with Corny Buns. Corny Buns starts with a headbutt doing about 30%, and Wooloo does the same amount, but with the tackle. We do this one more time, and then Corny Buns takes Wooloo out with a double edge. Grookey's out, and Bunza's HP is already quite low. I switch into Oreo Kid, and Scratch does way too much damage. I go for a draw peg, but it's weakened by Grookey's growl. It still does just over half. Another Scratch makes me realise that I was in crit range, and a second draw peg finishes Grookey off. Hop's Rookadee is next, and Oreo's health is quite low, so I switch into IT Nick. Rookadee uses peck on the switch in, and that once again does way too much damage. Rookadi outspeeds with another peck, and puts Nick into range of a peck damage roll. Nick uses Night Slash, and it does... nothing. This was a mistake. After that disappointing display from IT Nick, I decide he stays in. And he barely survives the peck. Foul play brings Rookadi into red. A sucker punch then finishes Rookadi off, giving us a deathless battle. This very easily could have been a wipe, as I doubt any of my other Pokemon could have outsped Rookadi. Apparently almost ending the run wasn't enough for Hop. He also taunts me for not breaking the rules, as we head into the wild area where we get a bunch of encounters. Here we catch Yogurt the Tarogue, Dotal the Lotad, and Electrike who we call, uh, Trelick. that might be worse, Hamcob the Machop, and Senor V the Snova who has a busted moveset this early on. In Motorstoke we head into our hotel where some delinquents try and jump the queue. This is a violation of human rights in the UK, so we naturally have to teach them a lesson. Hamcop is really all we need for these battles. After dealing with some story stuff, we get two more encounters. 
Karma Pig the Magikarp, and Elk Swoop the Slowpoke. You don't need the DLC area for this, so this technically counts. As a side note, Elk Swoop gets an amazing natural moveset, only to lose 3 fourths of it at level 100. When has Psychop ever been used? This is pretty common among our future encounters. Before leaving Motostoke, Hop challenges us to another battle. Hop sends out Wulu, and I send out Elk Swoop. This time, a tackle from Wulu does barely anything, and a psychic from Elk Swoop crits, doing just over half. Two more psychics finish Wulu off. Look how little potions do. The AI basically wastes a turn. Garuki's next, and it starts off with a branch poke. Elk shrugs it off and gets off another critical psychic, doing over half. Elk Swoop proving he's not just a tank. A couple of psychics take Garuki down, but Elk Swoop's health is starting to look pretty low. Up next is Hop's terrifying Rookadi, but this time we have Tree Lick, and Rookadi is down with one discharge. Things had been going pretty smooth since our first Hop battle, but then I ran into someone who I honestly thought nothing of. Someone who I'd not prepared for. Schoolboy Peter. It starts off as any other Pokemon battle. Peter sends out Sizzlipede, and I send out Elk Swoop as that's who was in my party. Not an amazing matchup, but it's only a Sizzlipede, so how much can it actually do? It starts off with a bite and does a bit of damage. Nothing too special, but Elk flinches. I decided to stay in. Sizzlipede hits with another bite, but this time it crits. Psychic comes out, but barely scratches Sizzlipede. I already have to switch out, so I go into Oreo, but Sizzlipede's bite does more than half. I once again have to switch out. Buns is next, and bite does about 40%. Buns is in crit range, but I don't want to switch out again, so I go for a bounce. Of course, Corny Buns misses, and he takes another bite, but he dodges the crit. I switch into Tree Lick, and bite does about how much we expect. Tree goes for a discharge, and manages to paralyze Sizzlipede. Bite luckily misses a crit, and Tree finishes off Sizzlipede with another discharge, but it isn't over yet. Peter sends out Dutler, and we have to switch. Unfortunately, out of the two Pokemon that are still at full health, one is weak to Bug, whereas the other is weak to Psychic. I decide to go into Senor V, as it's bulkier, and Confusion does some damage. Senor goes for a Blizzard, and it manages to freeze Dutler, another Blizzard taking it down. That could have gone far worse. One Sizzlipede was more threatening than the entirety of Hop's team. At least we managed to get through that with no losses. While on Route 3, we catch Uglier Foss, the Gossifleur, and in the mine, we catch Anglo Roger, the Rog and Roller. A bit further into the mine, we come across Bead. He only has three first stage psychic Pokemon, so surely he'll give me an easier time. Bead leads with Solosis, and I send out Oreo. I start this battle off with a mistake. I assume Payback worked the same way as Revenge, where it has negative priority but it doesn't. So Drillpeck would have done more. Solosis goes for Endeavor. And this time I use Drillpeck, and it does significantly more damage, but misses the kill. And this is where my mistake comes to bite me. Solosis's confusion hits a crit and brings Oreo down, marking our first death, my only flying type right before the grass gym. Ironically, Brave Bird would have just done the job, but up until that point, I'd been really cautious about using recoil moves which clearly doesn't matter when you lose the Pokemon anyway. I send out Tree Lick and bring Solosis down with a Discharge. Gothisa is next, so I go for another Discharge that barely does anything. But then Gothisa hits back with a Scythe Beam that does massive damage. It wasn't even a crit. I send out Elk Swoop as it's the only Pokemon that can tank the Psy Beams. As expected, Psy Beam doesn't do much. And likewise, Psychic from Elk Swoop doesn't do much to Gothisa, but even less. And for the first time, I learned that Beats Gothisa has competitive as Psychic drops its special defense. Now the Pokemon that could two-shot most of my team has doubled its primary attacking stat. Slowpoke has definitely lost the one-on-one, -on -one, to say the least. Well, that's what I thought at first, until I remembered that we have a way out. And Gothisa goes for a tickle, completely wasting a turn as not only does it do no damage, but the stat drops are overwritten when Elk uses Psychop to copy Gothita's stats. Unfortunately, this wasn't necessary as Bead ends up throwing by only using Tickles, while we take out Gothita with a couple of Psychics. Hesena comes out and goes for a round that does way too much damage, even considering the stat drops. I swap into Corny Buns, but he takes way more damage than he deals out, so I quickly switch to Senor. Confusion confuses Senor on the switch, but I don't see a death, so I go for Blizzard, and it takes Hatena down. 
this would have been far easier if I just added IT Nick back on the team, but I'll be honest, I've completely underestimated these battles. I do become a bit suspicious as to why enemy trainers do so much damage, whereas my Pokemon barely scratch them at this point. So I dig into the files, and find out that feeding my Switch XP candies not only raised all Pokemon's level 100, but also set all trainers on max AI, and gave all their Pokemon max IVs. I decided to leave it as is, since this is clearly the way Game Freak intended the game to be played, as I very much am playing a legit copy, and definitely have no way of editing the game's internal data. Moving on to Route 4, we catch Hot Mew, the Meowth, I'm sorry. Before heading into Turfield, I try and grab a TM, but discover a secret rival battle. We get caught by this Poke Kid, who is most definitely Schoolboy Peter in disguise, as you'll find out. Joltik and Hamcop face off against each other. Two double edges bring Joltik down, and Grubbin comes out. But with Hamcop having taken damage, I have to switch out. On Buns' switching, Grubbin uses Vice Grip, doing a lot of damage. Buns goes for a bounce, and yup. And Grubbin hits with the bite, meaning Buns has to switch out again. Three of the remaining four healthy Pokemon I have are weak to bug. So I send out Tree Lick. Discharge does just under half, but at least paralyzes Grubbin. Grubbin uses Bug Bite and just misses the KO. At this stage I'm desperate, so I go for a Thunder. And it hits, bringing Grubbin down. What's up with these Bug type trainers? First it was Sizzlipede, and now Grubbin. Why am I struggling with one of the weakest types in the game? Anyway, we're ready for the first gym. While Oreo Kid would have been useful during this gym, Senor V was always going to be the star anyway, so its death wasn't too bad. I bring Corny Buns as my second Pokemon. Time for Milo. Milo leads with Gossifleur, and I send out Senor V. I just click Blizzard, and Gossifleur goes down. Elder Goss is out, and ready to Dynamax. Now as a reminder, I'm not allowed to Dynamax, which means we have to stall. And guess which move I've got to teach my two Pokemon? Protect. So Elder Goss Dynamaxes and uses Max Strike, doing just under half to Senor, but that's very much a roll. I use Blizzard, and it does about 40%. Unfortunately, Hail Damage does not bring it into KO range. That doesn't matter anyway, as I stay in to preserve Team HP, and the next Max Strike takes Senor V down. I send out Buns and go for a bounce, wasting a turn of Dynamax. And Elder Goss returns to normal. The next turn, Buns actually manages to hit a bounce, but just misses the kill. Fortunately, Round does not crit, and I take Elder Goss down with the headbutt the next turn, winning us the gym badge. This was supposed to be a deathless gym, and Senor V would have helped with the next one immensely. I hadn't really been paying attention up till this point, but it's clear that the difficulty is starting to ramp up. Our inability to Dynamax means that we have to stall for three turns while still taking hits. Trainers are starting to get better movesets, and some are even starting to use fully evolved Pokemon which we don't really have the luxury to use, since our Pokemon are already level 100. Well, technically we do, but let's put a pin in that for now. Onwards to Halbury, we catch a Minchino on Route 5 and call it Carbon Copy Minion. We once again had to fight some Team Yell Grunts. The first one gave me no issues as Ham Copper and most of the work, but the second one had a Sableye that was actually doing quite a bit of damage, and my team wasn't really prepared for it. I got a Lucky Thunder that not only hit, but also crit, so I really dodged a bullet there. Further up, we have another battle with Hop. Hop once again starts with Wulu, and we send out Anglo Roger. Wulu starts off with a double kick, but the first one doesn't do too much. I then remember that Anglo has weak armor, which will be useful later, but right now it's dangerous. I go for Sandstorm, for some reason. I think it was to get chip damage, but I have to switch out, so I think it hurts me instead. I switch to Elk Swoop and Wulu once again goes for a double kick. A couple of Psychics take it down. Corva Squire comes out so I switch into Tree Lick. Plug does quite a bit of damage to Tree because of the defense drop from Lear, and Discharge does a bit over half. It also paralyzes allowing Tree to outspeed and finish Corva Squire off with another Discharge. Finally it's Thwacky. I switch into Buns and take a Razor Leaf which does about Corsa. The next Razor Leaf crits putting Buns into KO range and Buns goes for a bounce. Bounce actually hits to do a lot of damage, but I have to switch, so I go into Uglier Foss, and Thwacky's Razor Leaf puts me directly into crit range. Unfortunately, all my Pokemon are in crit range, so I decide to stay in and go for Hyper Voice. It just misses the kill, and at this point I have to switch out. I go into Elk and he dodges the crit. At this stage I realize that none of my Pokemon outspeed. 
My only winning condition is sacking a Pokemon so I can switch into Hamcop and pray Blacky doesn't crit. And that isn't even guaranteed. But then I remember that Uglier Foss has a Regenerator. This gives me a slim chance to get a Deathless Hop, but I'm risking the chance of losing my best Pokemon against Nessa. My plan being, switch Foss in and out until we get a Raise Leaf miss, and pray that the high crit chance move never crits. It's a pretty dumb strategy, and I should be trying to get a safer Nessa win. Oh, the first one missed. As I was saying, I'm a strategic genius. Hop's team isn't too difficult, but considering we haven't got any evolved Pokemon, our team's quite frail, making crits even deadlier as they're harder to play around. That paired with a high crit chance move makes Thwacky into a bigger threat than it ever was. In Harbury, we can get another encounter through fishing, and we managed to land a 10% Basculin, which believe it or not, is probably our strongest Pokemon at the moment. It's a single stage Pokemon which is on average better than the first stage ones. It gets adaptability which makes its stab moves extremely powerful, and on top of that, it has a really good level 100 moveset. Unfortunately, despite all this, Snail Cup can't really do much to help us out aside from taking some water moves, but I don't really want to risk its life this early on, so he stays in the box for now. For this gym, I bring Uglier Foss, Tree Lick, and Hot Mew. It's not an amazing team, but we have no better options for water types. We skip straight to the gym battle as nothing of note really happens and totally not because I can't do puzzles designed for children. Nessa sends out Goldeen and I lead with Tree. Goldeen outspeeds and Water Pulse does a lot. Tree with Magnet manages to take down Goldeen with one discharge. Aracuda is next so I switch into Uglier Foss to take an Aqua Jet. Aracuda's first bite flinches Foss but the second one doesn't, allowing Foss to knock out Aracuda with Leaf Storm. I really hate that I have to rely on this move. The ace Dreadnaughts up, so I switch into Hot Mew predicting a rock move. Dreadnought Dynamaxes, but instead goes for a Max Darkness, which does a lot of damage. Mew protects to stall another turn of Dynamax, and Dreadnought once again goes for a Max Darkness. I'm going to be honest, Mew's only here to act as a decoy. It honestly has a pretty bad moveset, and I don't really see it being useful. I let it use Protect to give it a fighting chance, and it actually pulls it off. Dreadnought returns to normal so I give me a well deserved break and switch into Foss expecting a water move. I was correct and Dreadnought goes for a water gun. Water gun. I was just talking about how enemy teams are getting better and the gym leader's ace has water gun as its stab move. Even Goldeen got water pulse. Anyway I lied about Mew getting a well deserved break because I needed to activate Foss's regenerator so goodbye Mew. Don't look at me like that. Foss is back so I go for a leaf storm. Dreadnought outspeeds and it uses Headbutt, which flinches Foss. I guess I deserve that. I'm forced to sack Tree Lick to once again activate Regenerator. Dreadnought once again uses Headbutt, not getting a crit, and Foss pushes past it to hit a Leaf Storm, taking Dreadnought down in one hit, getting us our second badge. Only the second gym in, and we've already nearly lost the run. Considering we can only bring a limited amount of Pokemon with us, I think we did as well as we could have with the sex being necessary as we only have a limited amount of HP to spare. There is one thing I could have done to make this fight easier, but I decided that it would be more helpful further down the line, and we really aren't that far into the game yet, so a reset wouldn't have been too bad. Enough justifying my incompetence, moving on. On the way back to Motorstoke, we head through the second mine, aptly named Mine Number 2. Here I skillfully dodge the first few Pokemon, running right into Bead. And this time I actually bring IT Nick, and I go for a foul play that does a lot of damage. Turns out Solosis has some muscle. Solosis goes for an Endeavor. The next foul play takes it down. Ponise is out next after switch. I switch into Buns anticipating the fairy move. Ponise uses Confusion doing just under half and Buns uses Headbutt doing nothing. I decide to risk the crit using another Headbutt which still doesn't even get Ponise into half. Foss's turn and even Leaf Storm doesn't kill. At least it brings Ponise down into red which allows Slowpoke to kill with Psychic. Gothita comes out, so I switch into Foss, but take a lot of damage from Psybeam, so I switch into IT Nick the next turn. Gothita somehow outspeeds and goes for a Rock Tomb, but misses. Foul Play does just over half. I'll go for a Sucker Punch, but it still doesn't kill. Nick is terrible, but he actually survives the Rock Tomb. Another Sucker Punch takes Gothita down. Finally, it's a Tenor, so I switch into Snail Cup and go for an Adaptability Boosted Stab Backwards Hail, which annihilates her. Maybe I should have just started with Snail Cub. Yup, my team sucks. As my team hasn't got the benefit of having max IVs, I find myself being outsped quite often while also being hit harder. What we desperately need is bulk, which brings me to my next team member. Remember how I skillfully dodged those initial encounters? It's so I could get this little guy right here. Sunfisk is our second single stage Pokemon and is possibly the bulkiest team member we have. 
what I'm trying to say is Sunfisk may actually be useful filling a role on my team that no one else can do better being a damage sponge unfortunately its moveset is pretty mediocre I want it to be good so bad but that can be adjusted so welcome to the team Stu Finks outside of the mine we get another encounter which ends up being a coughing Fink Fog can stay in the box for now we head back to our hotel and get ambushed by Marnie I'll be honest, I completely forgot about this fight, so I hadn't really prepared my team. Krogunk's out first, and I sent out Snail Cub. A water Pokemon isn't really a good idea against a Pokemon Dry Skin, so I switched to Elk. Venoshock does quite a bit of damage, but Elk is still outside of crit range, so I stay in. Of course, Krogunk goes for a Sucker Punch, which doesn't kill, but definitely would have if it was a crit. Psychic finishes it off. Marnie sends out Scraggy, and it goes down to a couple of Aqua Tails from Snail Cub. Lastly, it's Morpeko. Man, if I only caught a Pokemon that wars this thing. Well, it's not in my party, so clearly I didn't. I switch into Anglo, who I risk for absolutely no reason, but he gets up for Stone Edge, doing a lot of damage. I switch out to Foss, who takes a surprising amount from Bite, but takes Mumpaka out with a Leaf Storm. This battle isn't hard, I'm just bad at the game. And now, unfortunately, our encounters haven't really set us up well for Kabu. The only Pokemon that can hit Fire types hard is Basculin. Rock and Roll has a pretty good moveset, but now that I'm fighting a team of fully evolved Pokemon, I'm not too convinced it will hold up as well. Fortunately, we have a few more encounters in the wild area with our catch cap now increased. As I head to North Lake Mylock, I can see that it's raining, which is perfect as this means that the most common encounter will be Palpatoad, who A, will be perfect for Kabu thanks to its typing, bulk, and moveset, and B, I love the tempo line, and sometimes it feels like I'm the only one. So naturally, we run into Gloom. It's called Doodish. Now it's not the worst encounter in the world, we have a leaf stone so we can get our first fully evolved Pokemon, but it won't really count for much if you can't get past Kabu. I also catch a Drifloon and call it Floor Dino. So that venture didn't really help us, but there's still hope yet. Gen 8 added a quality of life change that I never knew I needed, but feels like it was specifically added for this challenge. Rare candies now act as evolutionary stones for Pokemon that evolve by level up and are at level 100. I wasn't initially going to go down this route, as it felt it would make the challenge a bit too easy, but I decided it wasn't really conflicting with any rules, and since there are only a limited amount of rare candies in the overworld, that would act as a good balance. I won't be allowed to get any rare candies from renewable ways such as poker jobs or raids. So with that out of the way, we actually have access to one rare candy back in Wedgehurst, and my two candidates are Angler Roger, the Rock and Roller, and Dotel, the Lotad. I looked up Ludicolo's level 100 moveset, and it's terrible, so that was an easy decision. I don't know why, but in Gen 8, almost every Pokemon that evolves using an item has a really bad level 100 moveset. And this usually wouldn't matter as they have access to all their moves at the Mover Learner, but it really sucks for this challenge. So I use a rare candy to evolve Anglo Roger into a Baldor, and then trade it with my friend to get a Gigalith, marking our very first fully evolved Pokemon. Its moveset stays pretty much unchanged. So now we're ready for the next gym. And this time I bring Anglo Roger, Snail Cub, and Dotel. We also get another encounter here. I'll go for the Volpix as we can use a Firestone on it later down the line. I call it Love Pix. Kabu leads with Ninetales and I send out Angler Roger. Ninetales burns Angler using Will-O-Wisp, halving its attack, but Angler hits every single one of its Rock Blasts, and the Sandstorm takes Ninetales out. Arcanine's next, so I switch into Snail Cub. Snail Cub takes a bite that does surprisingly little. Arcanine uses Will-O-Wisp and Snail Cub hits with an Aquatel, doing just about half. I don't see Snail Cub fainting to a critical bite, so I stay in and go for an Aquatel, which thanks to the Sandstorm damage is guaranteed a kill. Center Scorch is on the field and I think you can guess why Dotel's here. He did a good job. I send Anglo back in, resetting the Sandstorm. I go for a Protect to stall another turn of Dynamax. The next turn, Max Flutterby does a massive amount of damage, but Anglo not only survives, not only hits the Stone Edge, but also crits, bringing the Gigantamax Sense of Scorch down in one hit, earning us the third badge. Anglo Roger is a beast. With that, we can head back into the wild area and get a whole bunch of encounters. Before getting our new encounters, I first grab a Leaf Stone from Turfield and a Fire Stone from the wild area to evolve Doodish into a Wild Bloom and Love Picks into a Ninetales. As you can imagine, they have terrible movesets. While in the wild area, I catch Brozorn, the Bronzor, Larsense, the Sneasel, Ordafy, the Ferroseed, Barkby, the Krabby, and a Skorupi, who I call Urk's Hoop. I also skip a couple of encounters as I figured I could wait for better weather. Now we head to Route 6, where I already knew who I wanted. This magnificent creature, an absolute powerhouse, possibly my favourite Pokemon from Gen 8, 
is also guaranteed. All I have to do is get past this route without getting any encounters. We add a Hilipo to the team. Next up in Sol's side, we have another battle with Hop. Hop sends out Cramorant and I send out Angler Roger. Cramorant dives into the water, but I decide to stay in and go for a Stone Edge. Dive does a bit, but not enough to kill with the crit, and I'm suddenly reminded of Cramorant's ability when Stone Edge hits. It still seems to be out of crit range, but I should have been more careful. Next up, Hop sends out Silicobra, and I switch into Doodish. Dig doesn't do too much against Dish, and Absorb restores most of the damage it does anyway. So after a few Absorbs and a Paralysis, Silicobra goes down. Thwacky's out to terrorize me again, but this time I have counters. I know Thwacky can't really do much to Dish, so I stay in and Thwacky goes for a Screech. Dish uses Venoshock but misses the KO. Afraid of the lower defense, I switch into Love Picks and Razor Leaf does nothing. And Amber takes it down the next turn. Toxel is last but goes down to a single Bulldoze from Stufinx. This top battle was far easier. It goes to show how much of a difference having evolved Pokemon makes, even with bad movesets. That and Hop's team was pretty bad this time around. I don't really have many options for Ghost Pokemon, but we do have a rare candy that we found on Route 6. I use it on Urk Soup to evolve it into a Drapion, and surprisingly, it has a really good moveset. For the next gym, I bring Anglo Roger, La Sense, IT Nick, and Urk Soup. On the way to Alistair, this Corsola gets two Ancient Power Omni boosts in a row. Alistair leads with the Umask, and I lead with Urk Soup. A single crunch takes it down. Next up is Mimikyu, and it gets a critical slash. I go for a cross poison to break the disguise, and it also manages to poison. I switch into Angler Roger to preserve HP, and Mimikyu goes for baby dual eyes. Shadow Sneak comes out, not doing too much, and Angler Roger gets off a stone edge that also manages to crit, taking Mimikyu down. Angler does not miss. Casol is out, and immediately goes for a curse, cutting his HP in half. Anglo hits another Stone Edge, taking it down, but now Curse takes 25% of Anglo's health. Finally, Gengar's out, and I instinctively go for a Protect. I suddenly remember that G-Max Terror traps the opponent, but it goes for Max Darkness instead, allowing Anglo to see another day. I switch into Last Sense, and Gengar goes for another Max Darkness, doing barely anything. I know it's not very effective, but it's a Gengar versus Sneasel. That was pathetic. Last Sense goes for Protect, and Gengar uses Max Ooze, getting a special attack boost, finally ending the Dynamax. This was admittedly me being a bit overly cautious, but I was worried about the special boost, so I switched into IT Nick to get a clean switch into Urk Soup. Is anyone gonna miss him? Turns out I was right to be cautious, as a not very effective Hex does a lot of damage to Urk Soup. Luckily not enough to kill with a crit though, and Urk Soup goes for a crunch, which takes Gengar down in one hit, getting us our fourth badge. I decided to check why Gengar's Max Darkness did so little to Sneasel, and it turns out it was because it was coming off of a payback. A physical 50 power move. Why Alistair went for that instead of the stab special ghost move when they both are not very effective is beyond me. I'm honestly not sure if I've been underestimating or overestimating the trainers. As a reminder, they're set on max AI. We have another encounter with Bead, but this time with the inclusion of Urk Soup, a few crunches is all it takes. Rose abducts Bead, but that doesn't involve us, so we head to the forest to get another encounter. Here we get Phantump, which we call Thumpnap. For the fifth gym, I bring Anglo Roger, Urk Soup, Love Picks, and Doodish. We take failing in addition a bit too personally, so we fight an old lady to save face. Opal sends out Weezing and I send out Love Picks. I go for a Will-O-Wisp and Weezing goes for a Sludge, not doing too much damage. A few Hexes takes it down. Togekiss comes out, so I switch into Anglo. Thanks to Sandstorm, S-Slash does even less than it would have on the Switch. Togekiss goes for a Draining Kiss, not doing too much, and Anglo hits another Stone Edge, taking Togekiss down. I have never been this lucky with 80% accuracy moves before. More whiles next and I stay in knowing it can't really do too much damage to Anglo. If only there was a mechanic that actually made it useful. More whiles can't do much but it does lower Anglo's attack with Intimidate, and then goes for an Iron Defense. Of course Anglo doesn't care in Bulldoze crits. This one challenge has made me appreciate Gigalith so much more. It just missed the kill so More whiles manages to get a crunch, but the next Bulldoze takes it down. We're already on the ace Alcremi, so I switch into Doodish and Alcremi goes for a max finale. I go for a Protect and it once again goes for a max finale. I was a bit worried about Mystical Fire, but it's used Max Finale twice now, so I stay in and go for Venoshock. My hunch was correct and Alcremi returns to normal, and a couple more Venoshocks is all it takes. Turns out Draining Kiss really was its only attacking move. In fact, look at how bad this team is. The Ace only has one attacking move that's only 50 power. Her Weezing even has Tackle. It feels like the gyms are actually getting easier. Anyway, there's the fifth badge. On the way to the next gym, Hop challenges us once again. Hop sends out Trevenant and I lead with Urk Soup. Trevenant manages to survive Crunch and gets off a Confuse Ray on Soup. 
Hop heals Trevenant up, but thanks to the levels, it isn't enough. Urk Soup gets past the confusion and hits with another crunch, taking Trevenant down. Snorlax is next, and I decide to stay in to go for another cross poison. Unfortunately, this time Urk Soup hits itself, and Snorlax gets off a defense boost with Stockpile. Urk Soup hits itself again, allowing Snorlax to get another defense boost. Urk Soup hits itself for a third time in a row, a 1 in 27 chance, and Snorlax has gotten all of the defense boost it can from Stockpile. I guess I've been overworking Soup a bit too much. I switch into Anglo, taking the body slam, hoping the sandstorm might do a bit of chip damage. Snorlax hits first with a heavy slam that doesn't do too much damage, but Anglo Stone Edge does even less. I decide to stay in, hoping Stone Edge might get a crit, but after one finally missed, I was concerned Anglo was in crit range himself. I switch out to Stu Finks as he walls Snorlax and go for a snap trap, which I've never used before. But Snorlax outspeeds and hits with the body slam, paralyzing Stu. Where's Limbo when you need it? Luckily the next one does hit and I proceed to stall turns using Dig while Snaptrap takes Snorlax out. Unfortunately, Stu is still underground while Snorlax goes down, meaning he is forced to stay in for the next turn. Of course, Hop sends out Heatmore, but Heatmore outspeeds allowing Stu to dodge and get off a Dig that does massive damage. All part of the plan. I switch into Love Picks to absorb the fire move and take Heatmore down with a couple of hexes. Next up is Bolton, but it only uses Raw, so after a few moves it eventually goes down. Finally we have Rillaboom, and half my team has taken quite a bit of damage. I switch into Love Picks, but Slam brings it down into KO range. Forced to switch out, I go into Doodish when Rillaboom uses a knockoff doing a lot of damage as Dish was holding the leftovers, bringing it into Slam crit range. I don't really want to risk my team losing even more health, so I stay in and luckily dodge the crit from Slam. Venoshock does just over half. Now I have to sack a Pokemon. I go into Stew, anticipating the Slam, but it misses. Hop for some reason uses slam again, but it crits. Not enough to take Stu out though, and Stu gets off a snap trap. Unfortunately, Rillaboom goes for a drum beating, which finally takes Stu Finks down. Rest well, buddy. I switch into love picks. I'm still not too confident Rillaboom is in range of Ember, so I very stupidly go for a Will O Wisp, which of course misses. Rillaboom takes love picks down with a drum beating, and that was all on me. The only one of my Pokemon that outspeeds is Snail Cub, but if it can't one shot, it'll go down to one drum beating. The only Pokemon that I feel has a chance of surviving a hit is Urk Soup, but that's only if Rillaboom doesn't crit. Hop spares Soup's life and goes for a knockoff, Urk Soup taking Rillaboom down with a cross poison. I made a lot of dumb mistakes towards the end, but that was actually a really difficult battle. Hop's team is fully evolved and actually has a competent moveset. Congrats Hop, you gave me more trouble than the last three gems. On the way to Sir Chester, I catch, uh, Sup? The Meow Stick. And Brit Rum, the Gerda. Before fighting the gym, I trip my friends to evolve Brit Rum into a Conkelda. For Melanie, I bring Anglo Roger, Snail Cub, Erg Soup, and Brit Rum. Melanie sends out Frostmoth, and I send out Anglo Roger. Frostmoth starts off with Hail, overriding Anglo Sand, and Anglo misses a Rock Blast. Frostmoth uses Feather Dance to lower Anglo's attack, but Anglo hits Rock Blast enough times to bring Frostmoth down. Darmanitan is out, and it's scary. Luckily, it goes with Taunt on the switch into Erg Soup. The next turn, Darmanitan uses an Icicle Crash that does just over half, and Urk Soup uses Brick Break doing just under half, which is actually beneficial to us as otherwise Darm would switch into Zen Mode which is faster and stronger. I switch out into Snail Cub and he manages to tank the Icicle Crash, and does a lot of damage to Darmanitan with the Head Smash bringing it down, unfortunately also doing a lot of damage to itself. Ice Q's out and has an ability to tank any physical move. Unfortunately, my entire team is physical so I decide to stay in with Snail Cub to break the Ice Face. Goodbye, Snail Cub. I send out Brit Rum, and Ice Q goes for Hail, reactivating its ability. Brit Rum breaks it with a Brick Break. Ice Q goes for Amnesia, but that doesn't matter to a physical attacker, and Brit Rum gets killed with Brick Break. Finally, it's Lapras, and this thing is terrifying. Not only does it have a good moveset, but when Dynamaxed, one of its stab moves sets up an Aurora Veil, which halves the damage from both physical and special attacks, and the other one sets up Rain, giving it a boost to all of its water moves. I start with the Protect and Lapras uses Max Geyser. Even with the Protect, it does quite a bit of damage, but more importantly, sets up Rain. The next turn, I'm forced to make a difficult decision. I know Brit Rum isn't going to survive a Rain boosted Max Geyser, but he's my best chance of beating Melanie. I switch it to Angler Roger, hoping that Sandstorm can buy another turn. Angler Roger does indeed manage to survive the hit, but only on 2 HP, even with the Sandstorm boost. Unfortunately, Rain is back up. I switch into Urg Soup, knowing what fate awaits her, and she goes down to her Max Geyser. At this stage, I know exactly what the right play is, but I've lost almost all of my good Pokemon, so despite knowing what to do, I get greedy and send out Brit Rum, hoping a Surf won't kill. 
But with it being rain boosted, of course it does. Angler Roger, despite being my best Pokemon, can't really do much and is outsped, going down to a surf. Our first run ending here. The right play would have been to switch into Anglo first, overriding the rain, and then Brit. But I got greedy. To be fair, I don't know for sure if Brit could have survived the surf, or even one shot for that matter, but it was still the safest option. Anyway, time to run it back. Don't worry, now that I've gone over the way the challenge works, I'll skim over this run until we get to where we were. I actually skipped a run, because by the time I got to Milo, it was pretty obvious that I didn't have a consistent way to beat Nessa, let alone Kabu. I once again start with Corny Buns. And this time when faced with the wolf, I try and see what would happen if Buns uses Bounce. It says it had no effect, which is weird as nothing is supposed to happen yet. And now it's asking me to use a move. Maybe Buns will materialize in front of me if I use a headbutt, and oh, we've lost him to the void. Well, the Nuzlocke hasn't started yet. On routes 1 and 2, we catch Work TV's the Squovert and Ampre the Yampa. Hop was really easy this time around as Work TV's has counter and an ability that restores a third of its HP when it eats a berry. And Rookadee can't do much to stop Ampre. In the wild area, we catch a Venolite and call it a live tin. Big Burn the Grubbin. Null Wig the Wingle, who has hydration that will later become Drizzle when it evolves into a Pelipper. And we welcome back Doodish, now an Oddish. Ham Cop, who actually has no guard this time and Elk Swoop. The battle with Hop and Motorstoke is uneventful as we have a counter for each of his team members. On Route 3, we catch Gersey Howl, the Growlithe, who unfortunately didn't have Intimidate, but who we can evolve immediately using a Firestone. I decide to keep her as is for now as Growlithe has a better level 100 moveset than Arcanine. We also once again get Angler Roger in mind number 1. Bead's also far easier this time around thanks to Woke TVs being surprisingly bulky for a first stage road in Pokemon. Having access to the aforementioned ability and also getting payback which thanks to its speed is always boosted. On Route 4 we catch Markry the Mossery who's also possible to evolve immediately. This time for Milo I bring Gertie Howl and Big Burn. And Big Burn outspeeds and sets up a sticky web. Gossifleur goes for a round, after which it goes down to a couple of X scissors. Eldegoss is out. I stall for a couple of turns with Big Burn, but unfortunately he goes down on the second turn. Gersey Hal stalls using Protect, but Max Strike crits. Thankfully Grassy Terrain also heals Gersey up so she can go for a Flare Blitz, but just misses the KO. Gersey was also not in range of a round crit, even with a recoil. Gersey outspeeds so Reversal can safely take down Eldegoss, getting us the first badge. The hot battle starts off easy enough with Wulu and Cause Squad not being able to do much, but Thwacky is still a threat. Gertie immediately takes a crit on the switch and being put into crit range, so I switch into Doodish. Dish uses a couple of Moon Blasts to get chip damage, but has to switch. I switch into Ampre, but Razor Leaf does a lot, and she's already in crit range. I decide to stay in, and she dodges a crit, but Crunch doesn't do much. Unfortunately, it's pretty obvious that I need to sack someone to get a safe switch in, and despite the next gym being a water gym, I decided it's time for Ampre. Prey goes down, giving Nullwig a safe switch in. The wacky goes for Screech, but Nullwig manages to land an Air Slash, taking the wacky out. It wasn't that bad of a battle, but we did lose our only Electric type right before a Water Gym. Fortunately, we have a TM from the last gym that can be taught to one of our Pokémon once they evolve. So we head back to Motorstoke to challenge the cafe owner so we can get a Sweet. Oh. We patiently wait a day to get another chance to battle him to get a Strawberry Sweet. With that, we can evolve Milecry and Salcremi and teach her Magical Leaf. So now we're ready for Nessa. This time I bring Doodish, Elk Swoop, and Malkry. Goldine outspeeds and uses Horn Attack. Magical Leaf from Malkry just misses the KO. Luckily Horn Attack doesn't do a lot, so Malkry can just recover to maintain more HP. A second Magical Leaf takes Goldine down. Aracuda starts off with an Aqua Jet, doing about the same as Goldine's Horn Attack, but goes down to one Magical Leaf. Dreadnought's out, so I start with a Protect. Max Strike does nothing against Malkry. Malkry isn't in range of fainting to a regular max strike, but it is in range for a crit. I decide to risk the crit and stay in. My fear is unfounded, however, as Dreadnought goes for a max geyser, which I know is coming off of a water gun. Thanks to Dreadnought's low special attack and Malkry's decent special defense, I'm not too worried. Malkry recovers all the damage it took that turn. I decide that I don't want to risk flinches from Dreadnought's headbutts as Malkry is still useful, so I switch into Elk Swoop with the single intention of giving Dish a safe switch in. Goodbye, Elk. I send out Doodish, and Dreadnought uses Razor Shell? It had Razor Shell. Turns out I got unbelievably lucky, and Malkry could have very easily died. Even Rain Boosted, Razor Shell couldn't have killed with a crit, so Dish gets off a safe petal dance, taking Dreadnought out in one hit. And that's Nessa. The AI in this game confuses me. We get a few more encounters. Dull UK's the Duskull, and Sky Tun the Stunky from the Wild Area. And also Auradork the Aracuda from Fishing in Holbury. The second beat fight is pretty uneventful as four of my team members have super effective moves against Psychic, and most importantly, Cry can basically wall his entire team with Recover. 
On the way to Motorstoke, we welcome back Stu Finks and catch Cargo Kun, the Crow Gunk. Now it's time for Kabu. And we have a couple of options. As we have a rare candy from Wedgehurst, we can evolve one of our Pokemon. As much as I've come to love Gigalith, I decided that Nullwig with Drizzle will give me much more consistent battles. I mean, just look at Pelipper's level 100 moveset. We fight Marnie, and look how busted he is. Both Krogunk and Scraggy go down to a 100% accurate Hurricane, and Morpeko can't really do anything to Stu Finks. Before fighting Kabu, I also evolved Gersey Hal into Nark 9 for the extra bulk. Unfortunately, look at that moveset. For this fight, I bring Aura Dork, Gersey Howl, and Nullwig. This time I decided to go for Litwick as I love the little guy and we've already used the Firestone. And there's a Dust Stone we can get in Stone Side. And yup, I forgot that the trainers also have level 100 Pokemon. And both Ninetales and Arcanine get obliterated by a single rain boosted Hydro Pump. I switch it to Gertie to stall a couple of turns of Dynamax. And on the last turn, I use Bordeaux since I can't protect. Only for Kabu to use his Set to Scorch's signature fire move on a Pokemon that has Flash Fire. The rain dies down, so it's the perfect time to switch into Null. This was me being a little bit too cautious, but I go for a Roost as Cinderscore chooses Smokescreen. This could have been really bad, but luckily Hurricane completely bypasses the accuracy check in rain. So two of those later, Scorch goes down. Nullwig is a beast. Back to the wild area to get some more encounters. Here we welcome back Urksoup the Scorupi, who even has battle armor this time. We catch Wu Rep the Quagsire, Caster Sub the Maractus, Legtot the Golette, Elmo Parsi, the Palpatode, and Nutway, the Wobbuffet. I also skip a couple of encounters because of the weather that I totally remember to get later. While in Hammerlock, I find out that there's another rare candy that I could have gotten. I immediately evolve Urksu back into a Drapion. And now we're at the hardest part of the challenge. We need to get through the entirety of Route 6 without guessing an encounter. Unfortunately, during my haste, I forgot that Pseudo Wudo had Sturdy and lost Caster Sum, who I was actually looking forward to use. But we managed to make it to Starnside and back to Carolus without running into a Pokemon, which means we have access to this beautiful boy right here. He even has Strong Jaw. I call him Chad Visor and just look at his moveset. I'll skip the battle with Hop since none of his Pokemon could touch mine. For Alistair, I bring Gertie Howl, Stu Finks, Urg Soup, and Chad Visor. Your mask actually survives the first crunch but only goes for a hex, which does nothing. The next crunch finishes it off. For Mimikyu, I bring out Stu Finks. Snaptrap breaks his disguise but also does passive damage. It goes down to stalling with protect and a couple of bulldozers. Kursola goes straight for a curse, halving its HP and still uses Snaptrap. Hex from Kursola does a lot but a boosted payback takes it down. If Hex had crit, Stu Fink would have died to curse damage. For Gengar, I switch right into Urk Soup. This time it actually goes for G-Max Terror that does a lot of damage, also trapping Soup. I stall using protect but Gengar goes for Max Ooze, raising its special attack. There is no way Soup is surviving G-Max Terror. I go for a crunch, actually outspeeding Gengar and doing over half, and Gengar goes for Max Darkness, the physical non-stab move. The next crunch finishing it off. Don't get me wrong, I'm glad I didn't lose Urg Soup, but seriously, what is this AI? Like, was it predicting a switch? I could understand that, but Soup had literally just been trapped by its G-Max move. Anyway, moving on, Urg Soup survived, so beat is a non-issue. For Opal, I bring Urg Soup, Nullwig, Gersey Howl, and Stu Finks. Wheezing out speeds Nullwig doing a bit of damage with Sludge, but Null is just outside of crit range. Null hits Hydro Pump that just misses the KO. Opal's question actually allows Null to outspeed, and she takes Wheezing down with the Hurricane. Togekiss is next, so I switch into Stu to tank the Ancient Power. The first air slash flinches Stu, but Opal gives it a boost to its defenses, making it hard wall Togekiss. A combination of Snap Trap, Protect, and Leftovers brings Togekiss down, while keeping Stu at almost full HP. More wall feints to a snap trap and a couple of boulders is not being able to do much to Stu. Elkremi's out and as we've learned, it can do nothing to Stu. And that's Opal. Time for Hop. Trevenant manages to survive Nullwig's first hurricane and gets off a Confuse Ray. Null pushes past Confusion and hits a second hurricane bringing it down. Bolton's Crunch doesn't do much to Stu but lowers its defense putting it into crit range. Boulders does just over half. I switch out to Urg Soup but Bolton goes for a roar bringing Stu Finks right back out. No longer worried about a crit, Boulders ends Bolton. Heatmore is next and is obliterated by a weather ball from Null. Snorlax comes out and I switch to Chad Visor while Snorlax sets up a stockpile. 
a rain boosted Fisher Seren just misses the KO thanks to Snorlax's raised defenses, but Snorlax just goes for another stockpile. A second Fisher Seren is all it takes. The scary Rillaboom is out, but I send out the still healthy Urk Soup and bring his HP down with a couple of cross poisons. I was a bit worried that Slam was a range, so I switched into Gertie Hell, but looking back, it clearly wasn't, and Soup has battle armor, so there was no risk of a crit. So that was basically a wasted turn. Also, Rillaboom goes for Bruisal Swing for some reason. Regardless, Gertie outspeeds and brings an end to Rillaboom with Fire Fang. That was much easier this time around. On Route 7, we catch Iron Pearl, the Lipard. I learned that the Girded that we caught last run was actually only a 10% chance in shield, but luckily we already caught Rog and Roller and Golette, meaning that Gerda is the second most common encounter. But of course we get the more common Pawniard. We call a reward pin. Definitely not a bad encounter, but Conqueror would have been so much better for Melanie as Lapras is the main threat. I decided to evolve a ward pin into a Bishop anyway, as it has a really good move pool. And we're back to where we were. For Melanie, I bring a ward pin, Marl Cry, Chad Visor, and Gertie Howl. A single Fire Fang from Gertie destroys the 4 times weak Frostmoth. Darmanin's hand spares us a turn by using Taunt, but Fire Fang just misses the KO, activating its Zen mode. A headbutt from Darm does a lot of damage, but a second Fire Fang brings it down. I don't know why I risked that 5% mischance. Ice Q's next, so I send out a Ward Pin. It uses Icy Wind on the switch, lowering a Ward Pin's speed, but triggering her Defiant, giving her a plus 2 attack boost. A Ward Pin still manages to outspeed, but Ice Q's Ice Face eats up the Iron Head. Of course, Ice Q goes for Hail, once again setting up Ice Face. Iron Head breaks Ice Face, and Ice Q uses Icy Wind, yet again boosting a Ward Pin's attack. This time Ice Q outspeeds, but goes for an Amnesia. And a plus 4, super effective Iron Head causes Ice Q to cease to exist. Finally, it's Lapras. Now, I would have loved to stay in and bring it down using a plus 4 super effective Brick Break, but I'm not confident that a Ward Pin could have survived a Max Geyser. So I stole for one turn using Protect, and yeah, there was no way. I switch into Chad to eat up the second Max Geyser and then stall with Protect, ending Lapras's Dynamax. Unfortunately, it's set up in Aurora Veil. I switch into Malcry, hoping to stall out the Rain and the Veil. Luckily, Lapras only uses Icy Wind on the switch. A Protect later, the Rain subsides. I decide to test the waters and stay in. Lapras goes for an Ice Beam, which does a lot, but not enough to KO, even with the crit. What I'm worried about is that Freeze Chance. Cry recovers, restoring the HP it just lost. Lapras goes for a nice beam, not getting the freeze, but putting Malkry into crit range. For some reason, I go for a magical leaf while the veil is still up instead of protect. I decide to risk the crit and stay in. Lapras doesn't get the crit, and Cry is able to recover out of crit range. I decide to switch into Chad, and luckily Lapras goes for a surf, which does nothing to him. I use protect to see what move comes out, and it's Icy Wind. And that gives me an idea. I switch into Gertie on the Icy Wind, and see that the AI uses surf when I use protect. I then switch into Chad to tank the surf and then use a crunch to reveal that it's a 2-hit KO. Lapras goes for an Icy Wind. Now I can safely switch into Gertie anticipating the Ice Beam. Unfortunately, Ice Beam does a lot. The plan was that I could now switch back into Chad and kill with the crunch, but now I'm not sure if Ice Beam's a range on Arcanine and if the AI would go for that instead of Surf. I mean, we've seen how weird it can be. I decide to learn from my past mistake, and as much as I love Gertrude, the safe switch into Chad guarantees the win. I try to give Gertie a fighting chance and use Fire Fang, and it just misses the KO. But Lapras flinches, allowing Gertie to get the kill with Bite. That battle was an absolute roller coaster. And this was definitely the hardest fight that I've had this challenge, and there were definitely ways I could have done this better, but with the Pokemon I brought, I think I did pretty good. After looking at a fantastic poster, Hub forces another battle upon us. He leads a double, and I send out Chad. A single Ficious Ren takes it out. Snorlax is next, and I stay for another Ficious Rend, but it isn't enough to knock it out, so Snorlax goes for a Body Slam. Luckily it doesn't paralyze and another Ficious Wren knocks Snorlax out. Corviknight comes out and I switch into a Ward Pin expecting a flying move but it goes for a scary face lowering a Ward Pin speed but doubling her attack. Corviknight goes for a draw peg not doing anything and I go for a Brick Break but despite the boost it doesn't do much either. I set it with a Swords Dance and take Corviknight down with a Brick Break the next turn. Rillaboom's on the field so I switch into Null Wig on the Brick Break. Rillaboom does a lot of damage with knockoff and Null uses Hurricane, but doesn't quite get the KO. It does, however, confuse him. I switch into Gertie and Rillaboom passes through the confusion and uses a drum beating, doing almost half. And this time Rillaboom hits itself. Urk Soup outspeeds and gets the kill with a cross poison. Hop gives some encouraging words to his dying Pokemon. Pink Urchin comes out but slowly dies to crunches while all it can do is curse. And that was relatively painless. On Route 9, I catch up in Kirchin myself and call her a runic pinch. Outside of Spike Myth, Marnie charges us an entrance fee, but we aren't having that, so we fight her instead. Marnie's live part starts off with a fake out, then a sucker punch, surprisingly hitting quite hard. Null's weather ball just barely misses the kill. Marnie goes for a futile heal, and Null locks Nipard out with another weather ball. A couple of bulldozers take more Peko out, is what I would have said, but as you can see, I wasn't really paying attention and got hit with the torment.
I tried five times. I instead go for a snap trap and protect, giving Morpeka a slow, painful death. And this is all on Marnie. I switched to Markra and Marnie's Scrafty, but Brick Break and Crunch do a lot. Doesn't matter though, as Scrafty goes down to a single Dazzling Gleam. I switched into a Ward Pin, expecting a poison move, but this could have been risky based on the plays we've seen the AI make in the past. And then I switched into Null on the fighting move, but it goes for a Sucker Punch. Toxicroak outspeeds and goes for a poison jab, making me realize that I was in crit range. But luckily, it didn't, and it gets blown away in a hurricane. We go through this long corridor, apparently called a gym, and witness some truly amazing singing that could make a statue cry. For peers, I bring Urk Soup, a ward pin, Mal Cry, and Chad Visor. I forget that I have Urk Soup as the lead, so I switch right into Mal Cry as Scrafty goes for a fake out. Scrafty goes for a brick break, keeping Mal Cry just above half health, and Dazzling Gleam decimates Scrafty. Pierce sends out Malamar and is kind enough to tell me his strategy. I switch into Chad and take a Psycho Cut. Malamar goes down to a Ficious Rend. Obstagoon is already out, so I go for another Ficious Rend, but Obstagoon uses Obstruct, lowering Chad's defense sharply. I switch into a Ward Pin and Obstagoon goes for a Throat Chop. Afraid of a fighting move, I switch into Urksu, but Obstagoon just goes for an Obstruct. Urksu uses a Brick Break, which is four times effective against Obstagoon, and does less than half. Huh. Throat Chop doesn't really do much in return. I decide to stick to what works and go for another brick break, leaving Obstacle in the red and... Oh. I guess I was right to be worried about a fighting move. I send out a ward pin and outspeed, taking Obstacle out with the brick break. And lastly, it's Skun Tank and it faints to two iron heads. And not gonna lie, losing Erksu was actually pretty devastating. And to die in such an undignified way to a counter hurts even more. She deserved better. Straight on to Raihan, this gym's the only one that features double battles in the game. To counter Raihan Sandstorm team, we bring a rain team, sort of. And this time I bring Dull UKs, Wu Rep, Null Wig, and Chad Visor. Raihan leaves with Flygon and Gigalith, and I send out Dull UKs and Wu Rep. I immediately switch into Null to stop the rain. Flygon goes for a breaking swipe when I was expecting Crunch, and Gigalith uses Body Press on Null. And Dull uses an icy wind, hitting both opponents, lowering their speed. Null uses Protect, nullifying the Thunder Punch, and Dull burns Flygon using Will O Wisp. And Gigalith uses Rock Blast, but on Null. Surprisingly a good play. And despite the crit, Dull barely survives on 5 HP. This is both good and bad. And good because Dull can now survive a bit longer, but bad because the switch has to take a hit. I'm not as worried about Thunder Punch now thanks to Flygon being burned and Null's defenses, so I keep Null in. However, I do switch out Dull for Chad, who takes a crunch from Flygon, probably seeing the kill on Dull. It also crits and lowers his defense. Great. And Gigalith doesn't get a turn as Null takes it out with the Weather Ball. He's no Angler Roger. Chad outspeeds with the Choice Scarf and obliterates Flygon with Ficious Rend. Sandaconda, however, paralyzes Chad with Glare. No just needs to use another Weather Ball and Sandaconda goes down. Hitting Sandaconda sets up another Sandstorm. And this order of fainting Pokemon was actually very important as now Duraludon's out by himself. Duraludon has two possible actions, either a G-Max depletion into Chad or a Max Rockfall into Null. I gamble that it will go for a Dragon move seeing the kill so I switch into Dull. My hunch pays off, so goodbye Dull. Null gets off a Roost. I switch into Wu Rep and now I'm expecting a max rock fall so I go for a protect on Null. I was correct and it does very little damage. Wu Rep gets off an earthquake that does about 25%. Null can't safely protect again so I switch into Chad. Max rock fall thankfully wasn't able to kill even with the crit. I use Icy Wind so that Chad doesn't get hit but it also lowers Duraludon's speed. Duraludon returns to normal. The next turn I switch back into Null. Duraludon goes for a breaking swipe lowering my side's attack. Wu uses Earthquake but it's clear that Duraludon won't go down the next turn. No protects, but Duraludon uses Breaking Swipe once again, lowering Wu's attack. Another Earthquake brings Duraludon into red. Thanks to the earlier speed drop, Null outspeeds and uses Weather Ball to put an end to Duraludon, getting us the final badge. This battle was actually really fun to plan out. Double battles during Nuzlocke are pretty scary as every turn one Pokemon is at risk of being hit twice, which increases your chance of losing one. And that with how unpredictable the AI has been forced me to think of the most consistent way to win with my encounters, even if it meant sacrificing them, which is why you might have seen me make some more riskier plays. All in all, Dolls being our only death was actually one of the better outcomes. We may have all the badges, but there's still a huge chunk of the game left, with most of the important trainers being able to Dynamax from here on out. God, this video is going to be so long. Before heading into Winden, we catch our final few encounters. On Route 10, I catch Jim Rem, the Mr. Mime, and then in the wild area, I catch Dove Pie, the Unpheasant, and Dojin, the Dublade. On the way to Winden, this trainer with the Gorilla Tactics Darmanitan, an ability that works like Choice Band, uses Taunt. And now in Winden, we can head straight to the Champion Cup. For Marnie, I bring Mal Cry, a Ward Pin, Null Wig, Chad Visor, and Stu Finks. Leading with Mal Cry, I go for a Protect, anticipating Lipart's fake out. 
Lipard uses Torment, but a single dazzling gleam takes it out. Toxicroak next, so Sindad Stufeng scouting the poison move, but Toxicroak goes for a swagger instead. I immediately switch out into Nullwig. Toxicroak uses Sucker Punch instead of a fighting move, so that was a free switch. Toxicroak uses Venoshock that does about a third and then goes down to a Hurricane. Morpekka's out, so I switch into Stufeng's on the Spark. Morpekka uses Torment and Stu hits with Bulldoze doing over half. I stall a turn of Taunt using Protect and after a flinch from Bite, Morpekka feints to a second Bulldoze. I switch into Malkry to take Crafty's Brick Break and then she recovers all the damage she took from Crunch. Pushing past Swagger's Confusion, Cry takes out Scrafty with a single Dazzle Gleam. Finally, it's the Grim Snarl. I switch into Stu on the G-Max Starfall, setting the terrain and reminding me that Stu Finx actually has an ability. Unfortunately, it activated at the worst time as now Stu's a Fairy type, which means a Fairy move is coming out, which none of my other Pokemon can resist. The plan was to switch out on the Dark move, but I just go for Protect instead. And Marnie actually goes for G-Max Snooze on the now Fairy Stunfisk. Also, how weird is it that G-Max Grimstar has one stab move that puts the opponent to sleep, and another that sets up a terrain that nullifies statuses? Sadly, I once again have to sack Stu Finks, and Grimmsnarl uses G-Max Snooze. Sorry Stu, you died for nothing. I switch into a ward pin on the end of the Dynamax and Marnie stalls the inevitable by using a bulk up and a full restore while a ward pin slowly brings down Grimmsnarl with a few iron heads, and we've won the first battle in the Champion Cup. For Hop, I bring Gersey Hell to replace Stu Finks. And Double goes down to a single Fisher's friend from Chad. Chad just misses the kill on Snorlax and gets hit with the hammer arm. Hop heals the next turn using a full restore and then a couple more Fisher's Wrens and Snorlax. Corviknight's turn and he actually survives the first Fisher's Rend, getting off a scary face. After hitting Chad with Draw Peck, Fisher's Rend. I switch into Gersey Hell on Rillaboom's Dynamax and take a max strike that does a very sad amount. Max Quake does more than max strike even through Protect. I wonder what move that Max Strike was coming off of. I switch into Null anticipating the Max Quake but Hop reads me and goes for a Max Darkness. I stay in and Rillaboom goes for a Snarl. With the special attack drop from Snarl and the special defense boost from Max Quake, Hurricane does less than half. I pivot a couple of times hoping to remove Null stat drops and sell Brain again but when I switch into a Ward Pin, Rillaboom goes for an Uproar, a special move. Snarl I can understand but Uproar? Anyway with Rillaboom locked into Uproar, a Ward Pin takes Rillaboom down with a few Iron Heads winning us the prelims. We now have to storm Rose Tower because Hop was hungry and Oleana goes along with it since she wants to watch us play hide and seek with her staff. I really don't know what the story was trying to go for here. Oleana gets upset that she wasn't part of our game of hide and seek. Frostless starts off by burning a ward pin and the ward pin does over half with Iron Head. Frostless uses double team causing a ward pin to miss the next Iron Head. Hex does a lot of damage but a ward pin's able to hit Frostless bringing her down with Iron Head. I switch into Null when Salazzle comes out, Venoshock does just over half and Weather Ball obliterates her. Zarina's next, but I'm worried about Null's low HP, so I switch to Gertie Hal, who takes a lot from Acrobatics. Zarina hits hard, so I'm a bit worried to switch, so I stay in and go for a sunny day to remove the rain, but the next Acrobatics crits, putting Gertie Hal down. I once again sack a Pokemon for no reason. Malkry takes just over half from Acrobatics and does just under half with Dazzling Gleam. I switch into a Wardpin, taking another Acrobatics, which is just outside of crit range. And then I switch into Chad, who's hit with Zarina's second critical Acrobatics. Luckily, Chad's still holding the Choice Scarf, so he outspeeds and brings an end to Zarina with Ice Fang. I switch into Wu Rep as my low tick goes for an Aqua Ring, and Surf from her does a lot of damage as Wu Rep uses Toxic. After many turns of stalling for the poison damage while my low tick just recovers her HP, my team has taken a lot of damage. Null's on the field and is in crit range of a rain boosted Surf, but it stays in and dodges the crit, getting off a roost, and finally, Poison takes my low tick down. And now it's Garbodor. I stay in with Null going for Protect and Max Rockfall hits, doing little damage. I switch into Wu Rep anticipating the next Max Rockfall and then stall the final turn of Dynamax using Protect. Garbodor returns to normal and goes for a Toxic Spikes. Wu Rep hits her with an Earthquake, just missing the KO. And Garbodor uses Gong Shot, which manages to poison Wu Rep but feints to another Earthquake. And that was unironically very tough. I wasn't aware of how diverse early on as team actually is and how hard some of our Pokemon can hit. Every one of my Pokemon were below half health by the end of that battle and we actually had a loss. After watching Rose's Time Chess Lightshow presentation, we can now head back to the Champion Cup. After getting abducted by Rose, Beats promise freedom if he can beat me. I bring Runic Pinch, a Ward Pin, Chad Visor, and Doodish, who I evolved but he kept as a Gloom for the better moveset. Morwile's Intimidate triggers a Ward Pin's Defiant, giving her a boost to her attack right off the bat. I decide to go for a Sword Stance while Morwile hits a Play Rough doing just under half. A plus three Iron Head takes more while down. And Guard Wars next and goes for a Calm Mind. A Ward Pin once again uses Iron Head. A Rapidash outspeeds and hits a Dazzling Gleam, revealing that all Ward Pin was in the crit range. It doesn't, so Iron Head. Finally, it's G Max Hatterene and Iron Head. 
and back to the mind speed. For Nessa, I bring Ruining Pinch, Doodish, Null Wig, Chad Visor, and Jim Rem, who I evolved into a Mr. Rhyme using a rare candy. Null uses Hurricane to destroy Galissapod before it can make a move. Barascuda hits with Liquidation, and Null goes for another Hurricane, confusing Barascuda. Barascuda hits itself, and Null heals itself with Roost. Barascuda gets a heal with Full Restore, and Null uses Weather Ball. Throat Chop does about quarter, and Null manages to hit a Hurricane even outside of rain to bring Barascuda down. Nessa sends out her own Pelipper resetting Rain and setting up a Tailwind, and Null once again uses Hurricane doing over half. Pelipper uses Air Slash, flinching Null, so I switch into Runic Pinch. Pelipper decides to set up Tailwind again and Runic Pinch electrocutes Pelipper with Zing Zap. I switch to Jim Rem while Seeking goes for an Aqua Ring. Seeking goes for a Mega Horn, but Jim dodges the crit and kills with the Freeze Dry. I switch into Pinch on Dreadnought's Dynamax and Max Darkness brings it to red. Pinch goes for a Protect, but the second Max Darkness takes her out. Sorry, Pinch. I send out Doodish and stall the final turn of Dynamax using Protect. Dreadnought outspeeds using Crunch, lowering Dish's defense, but Dish one-shots with Petal Dance. For Alistair, I bring Iron Pearl, Chad Visor, Award Pin, Null Wig, and Sky Sun. Night Slash from Pearl does just under half, but Dusknaw's Rock Tomb misses. The second just misses the KO, and Rock Tomb does just under half, lowering Pearl's speed. Dusknaw heals with Full Restore, but Pearl gets a crit Night Slash. Pearl still outspeeds to kill with the next Night Slash. I bring Null out on Chandelure, but it lowers her special attack with Mystical Fire. Chandelure burns Null, but Weather Ball still knocks Chandelure out. I bring out a Ward Pin for Kosola. Hex doesn't do too much, so I set up a Sword Stance. Kosola goes for an Amnesia anyway. A Ward Pin's Payback takes out Kosola. A Ward Pin outspeeds Poltergeist, and one Payback is enough. And Gengar Dynamaxes, but I decide to stay in. Of course, Gengar goes for Max Darkness, lowering her special defense but triggering her Defiant and Gengar has absolutely no way of surviving a plus 4 boosted payback. A ward pin has exceeded my expectations. For Ihan, I bring a ward pin, Chad Visor, Wu Rep, No Wig, and Jim Rem. Raihan leads with Torkoal and I lead with the ward pin. And this allows me to switch into Null, overriding the Sunry Rain and basing a fire move. Torkoal goes for a body press instead, which also works. A weather ball laser, Gudra's out. I switch into Wu Rep to nullify the thunder, and then I scout out the next move using Protect. I switch into Chad to eat the muddy water, and the rain subsides. I then switch back into a ward pin as Gudra sets up a rain dance again. Pin out speeds and uses Iron Head doing just over half. A rain boosted surf misses the kill, and a second Iron Head takes Gudra down. I switch into Chad as Tertinator fails a shell trap. A single Ficious Ren takes it out. I stay on Flygon and Chad out speeds with the Choice Scarf, once again taking it out with one Ficious Ren. Finally, the Ace Duraludon's out, so I switch into Null to take the G-Max Depletion, and then switch into Wu-Rep to tank the Max Rockfall. Finally stalling the last turn of Dynamax using Protect. Raihan uses Max the Rockfall again, for some reason. Duraludon uses Dragon Claw doing just under half, and Wu-Rep uses Earthquake doing just over half. Wu-Rep was just out of crit range, so a second Earthquake puts an end to Duraludon in the second phase of the Champion Cup. Rose broadcasts his plan to the world instead of just wasting a day to be a bit more covert for some reason so our match is interrupted as we have to deal with some more story stuff. We catch our final encounter in Slumbering Wield, Bullpig, the Orbeetle, and now we have to fight Rose to stop him from abducting us like Bead, I think. Rose starts off with Scavalier, and I bring back Corny Buns. Buns outspeeds and hits a Fire Fang, bringing a Scavalier into red. It also burns. A Scavalier hits Drill Run, just missing the kill thanks to the burn, and a second Fire Fang brings it down. I switch into Wu Rep on Kling Clang's Wild Charge, and two Earthquakes take it down. I switch into Nullwig and Ferrothorn misses a Power Whip. Hurricane does about a third and Ferrothorn uses Curse. Another Hurricane brings it to red and Ferrothorn once again goes for Curse. The next Hurricane takes it out. Weather Ball brings Berserker into red and then it hits back with a Throat Chop. I forget that Rain has ended so I go for another Weather Ball but that was far off from killing Berserker. Chad takes an Iron Head on the switch and then kills with Ficious Rend. I send out Wu Rep on Copperaja's Max Mindstorm which does well over half. Next up is a Ward Pin who isn't affected by Max Mindstorm. Finally, it's back into Null, who isn't affected by the Max Quake. Dynamax over. Chad returns to take Copperaja out with the rain boosted Ficious Rend. Rose shares his fantasy about being Leon's princess or something, so we slowly back away into the lift while he's distracted. Leon throws a Pokeball at the legendary Pokemon in front of him like the true champion he is, and now we're forced to fight it. Imagine how much better that scene would have been if they just changed that texture into a Master Ball. It would make Etonatus seem even more threatening and makes Leon look actually somewhat competent. But anyway, Etonatus goes down to a couple of earthquakes from Wu Rep. While Etonatus transforms into an Eldritch Abomination capable of destroying the world, Hop stares on ahead with a dumb, stupid, goofy smile. And people say he has no character. 
He's clearly a psychopath. Pulling out our spoils from our grave robbing escapades earlier launches us into an anime sequence as we summon some wolves that mega evolve through the power of friendship or something. Now I learned that I made a small mistake this turn. While feeding my switch some experience candies, some must have gotten lost as well Eternatus is level 100. Zamazenta and Zashin are not. But of course I went for Earthquake and with a boosted attack thanks to Zashian's howl. Goodbye Zashian. Also Wu Red barely survived a hit from Eternatus. But hey, at least we still have Zamazenta. He faints the next turn. Now typically in a Sword and Shield Nuzlocke, you're supposed to just stall turns while Zashian and Zamazenta do their thing. But for the first time, I actually have to put in work. Every turn there's a 50% chance that we get hit by a max move from Eternatus, and Eterna Max never ends. I switch into Null to South Brain and Double just barely survives a max worm wind. The next turn I switch into Chad while Double is erased from existence. Snorlax comes out and I switch into Malkry anticipating the worm wind. And Snorlax actually uses a super effective high horsepower. We're gonna be here for a while. Max Flare hits Malkry for little damage thanks to the rain but now the sun's up. Malkry scratches Eternatus with Dazzling Gleam and Snorlax helps. I switch into Null Wig to set the rain back up and hope that Flare comes out, but better yet, Eternatus uses Wormwind on Snorlax. Snorlax does his thing. I switch back into Cry for Wormwind and the next turn Eternatus hits with the Max Flare nerfed by the rain. The Dazzling Gleam and High Horsepower finally bring Eternatus below half. I switch back into Null resetting the rain and Eternatus uses Wormwind on Snorlax. I'm back into Cry and Snorlax finally gets brought down. Corviknight gets hit with Max Flare and Mile Cry recovers some HP. I keep switching in and out between Malkry and Nullwig, using a Dazzling Gleam when I can, while Corviknight slowly whistles down Eternatus with Brave Bird. Eventually, a Max Flare, even in the rain, melts Corviknight. Hop sends out Rillaboom and we continue to let Hop do the heavy lifting for a change, but Hop uses Drum Beating, a grass move and a Dragon Poison type. God damn it, Hop. And Rillaboom's now locked into uproar. Oh, he's free. Whatever will he go for now? Drum Beating. Also, I swear Eternatus has not targeted Rillaboom a single time since it was first sent out. Honestly, a pretty good strategy. I continue to switch in and out while Eternatus only targets my Pokemon and it finally decides to hit Rillaboom, taking it down. Unfortunately, I don't think Pink Urchins can be much more help. Malkry dodges a crit and recovers back half her HP. I go for a Protect assuming I'm about to get hit, but Eternatus aims for Pink Urchin instead, bringing it into red. I switch into Chad on the Max Flare and then on the next turn, Chad manages to outspeed holding a Choice Scarf and finishes off Eternatus with a nice fang living up to his name. And this is probably the only time I've ever struggled with the Eternatus battle and I was genuinely not expecting it to be so hard even with it being level 100. In my defense, I thought Zashin and Zamazenta would also be level 100. Also Hop's team is useless. We do what the champion cannot and catch Eternatus in a Pokeball. We're finally near the end. For the champion, I bring Wu Rep the Quagsire, Bolt Pick the Orbeetle, Mal Cry the Alcremi, Award Pin the Bishop, No Wig the Pelipper, and of course, Chad Visor the Draco Vish. Leon leads with Aegislash and I lead with Wu Rep. Aegislash moves first, changing to Blade Form and goes for Shadow Ball, doing a lot of damage. Thanks to the Blade Form's weak defenses, a single Earthquake takes it out. Next up is the Zaxorus, who is a massive threat as it has a move to one-shot each of my team members with the crit. I need a clean switch and I'm sure which move it'll go for because of the low HP, so sorry, Wu Rep. Haxorus is now locked into Outrage, so I switch into a ward pin. Haxorus hits first and does about a third, but unfortunately she gets confused, breaking out of Outrage. Payback does just over half. I switch into Null Wig, anticipating the Earthquake. Haxorus snaps out of confusion and hits an Outrage that luckily doesn't crit. And Noel finishes Hexorus off with Hurricane. Leon sends out Dragapult, so I switch it to Malkry, who gets hit with a Thunderbolt. And Dragapult goes for a Shadow Ball, and Malkry uses Dazzling Gleam, just missing the KO by literally 1 HP. And Malkry is now in range of a crit, but I'm unsure if Leon's going for a heal, so I stay in, and Leon goes for a Shadow Ball. With Malkry surviving on just 8 HP, Malkry brings Dragapult down with a second Dazzling Gleam. And Mr. Rhymes out, so I switch into a Ward Pin on the Psychic. A ward pin out speeds and a single iron head is all it needs. And next up is Inteleon, so I switch it to Bulpig, but Inteleon just goes for a tearful look. And that doesn't matter as all Bulpig needs to do is up a light screen and Dark Pulse flinches it. A second Dark Pulse takes Bulpig out. With my new intelligence, I switch back into a ward pin and my hunch is correct as Inteleon goes for a tearful look that triggers a ward pin's defiance. Twice. A plus three boosted payback absolutely destroys Inteleon. Finally, it's Charizard. I switch into Nullwig to set up the rain while Charizard Gigantamaxes. Charizard goes straight for its signature move, giving Null the heroic death she deserves. Oh, she survived? Not anymore. 
I'll get a clean switch into Chad thanks to Null Sacrifice. Chad outspeeds thanks to the Choice Scarf. And a strong Jaws Rain boosted Stab Vicious Ren puts an end to Charizard and the Nuzlocke. I actually had a lot of fun playing this challenge and it was a lot more difficult than I was expecting. And mostly due to the max IVs and the unpredictable AI, but still. I usually do dumb challenges like this in my downtime after work and there are a lot of interesting things that happened this run so I figured I'd try and make a video out of it. Also it makes me feel a bit more productive. So let me know how I did. Thanks for watching. I'm definitely going to try and do more challenges and hopefully I'll get better at this video making thing as I know this was very rough around the edges. So if you enjoyed this please look out for those in the future.